watch Civil War before you watch this review, because there's going to be a lot of spoilers and you should form your own opinion about the film. After all, everybody else likes it. It's making scary amounts of money, it's 92% fresh and rotten tomatoes, and the critics love it. But I don't agree with any of them. For me, a blockbuster should do five things. Have likeable and believable characters, a plot that makes sense, be well made, not be offensive, and make me feel something, preferably thrilled or you know, excited or happy or make me laugh. I think Captain America Civil War fails to some extent on all five criteria. This is going to be a long review, so I've roughly divided it into sections for you, which you can see now down below. If you're on desktop, you can click on those, or if you're on mobile, I've put the time codes in so you can skip along to them. And from here on out, beware spoilers. After the fight in Sokovia and a disastrous mission that sees civilian deaths in Nigeria, the Avengers are regulated through a set of accords passed by the UN. Meanwhile, Zemo manipulates events to sow distrust within the Avengers. He frames Bucky for a terrorist attack, leading Cap to go off-grid, find and defend his best friend, and uncover a plot which appears to be about super soldiers, but ultimately leads to Zemo showing Tony footage of his parents being killed by Bucky. Big fight, nobody's friends anymore. Roll on the next Marvel movie. In broad strokes, the plot works. It's got fighty bits and talky bits. It's all based around a healthy mistrust of government like Winter Soldier, which I loved. Unfortunately, the plot only makes sense if everyone in it acts like an idiot. Zemo gains access to Bucky by posing as a state-approved psychiatrist, and this is discovered by Captain America around the early middle of the film. So Captain America knows this, he knows this throughout the rest of the film, and he does tell Tony a couple of times. In fact, he does it really loudly while they're at the airport. He says, it's the doctor, it's the doctor, over and over again. But at no point do Cap or Iron Man consider just investigating the psychiatrist. And then, at the end of the movie, a maid comes and discovers the psychiatrist's body in his hotel suite, along with Zemo's ID, a load of terrorist kind of explosion equipment, and a disguise of Bucky. So in other words, Zemo literally left everything they needed to resolve the plot right there and then in the only place they knew about that he would have been in. To repeat this, if Tony Stark, noted super genius, had actually run a cursory investigation on the sole suspect that his ex-best friend and the guy he's currently hunting had told him to look into, the rest of the film would not have happened. If Captain America had just handed back Bucky into custody after discovering this and run his own investigation, the rest of the film would not have happened. If the Joint Terrorism Task Force, whose offices were raided, had investigated this or even run their own internal security properly, the rest of the film would not have happened. And to wind the clock back even further, Zemo's plan stems from something he discovered in secret Hydra files that were released by Black Widow at the end of Winter Soldier. These are publicly available files released from a secret Nazi-led organization that's been clandestinely running America's affairs for the last 50 years. And Tony Stark, noted super genius Tony Stark, didn't think it was worth investigating in the last 18 months, not even a peak. They were heavily encrypted files, but Tony designed three AIs over the course of the Marvel films, so I don't think it's entirely outside his remit, especially as it's apparently so easy that a random army commander could do it. In short, the plot doesn't work unless everyone in it acts like an idiot. Now, I'm not saying these are plot holes. They're definitely not plot holes. It's just terrible writing. I have a very strict definition of what a plot hole is. It has to be something that immediately sticks out in the film, which can't be resolved no matter how much you think about it. And actually, to its credit, I think there aren't any significant plot holes in this film in that sense. I mean, sure, there's loads of stuff that doesn't make sense. Why does Black Panther know to go to Siberia? Was he already following Tony? Was he heading to Siberia on a hunch? Is there a deleted scene they didn't leave in the film that explains all of this? Possibly, I don't know. I prefer to think that T'Challa's just flying around in his Quinjet endlessly waiting for something to happen around the raft. And of course, why is there a CCTV camera on a random stretch of empty road in rural Washington in the early 90s? But you know, the, while these things are annoying, they're not plot holes. A much bigger problem is that the actual Sokovia records themselves don't stop anything bad from happening. The Avengers, the state-sanctioned Avengers, end up having a massive fight in the airport that causes a huge amount of damage. That's very expensive, someone's got to pay for it. What's the point of having the Accords if they haven't got the oversight to stop that kind of thing happening? Rhodes gets injured in a friendly fire incident. I'm pretty sure that's not satire from Marvel, but it just seems to be a point that the Sokovia Accords don't really work. And in the last 20 minutes, Tony, despite being their biggest proponent, completely ignores them and goes off on his own personal vendetta. By that point, it's like the movie's forgotten about the Accords, which is good because everyone else has as well. In the end, it's not just that the plot is badly written or doesn't make sense, although both of those things are also true, it's that it doesn't accomplish what it would like to, even if it did work correctly. But enough about plot, let's talk characterization. 
For part of a franchise that's focused on consistency between films, the so-called shared cinematic universe, Civil War is incredibly inconsistent when it comes to characterization, both within its own runtime and in relation to other films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. To give just one example, Black Widow is actually on Tony's side in this film, the pro-registration side, despite being vehemently anti-government in the previous film, Winter Soldier. Wilson even points this out to her, at which point she just says, I've changed my mind. There are lots of odd character choices in this film, so I'm just going to focus on the two leads, Iron Man and Captain America. Tony has become an unlikable sociopath. After causing the mass destruction of Ultron, he's back at his old tricks, arbitrarily causing divides for his own selfish reasons, his guilt over the sole American death in Sokovia, never mind all the people in Nigeria, and his wish to be with Pepper Potts again. Oh yeah, they kind of broke up off screen. Just another thing that's completely inconsistent with this film versus the last one. And despite being all for the Accords at the start of the film and throughout most of it, he then just completely gives them up at the end without even thinking about it. Okay, that's enough about the Accords. I'm already forgetting about them just like the movie does. The movie sets up his belief in the Accords far too convincingly, and actually after all the destruction in this film you end up thinking, yeah, they could do with some oversight. And of course, Cap's fears that the UN will be too controlling are basically laughable to anyone who keeps up with current affairs. Like all good American liberals, Tony is fine with drones, fine with child soldiers, but he draws a line of extraordinary rendition. When he visits the offshore super prison that's keeping his friends in what he calls less than nice conditions, that's when he decides that the Sokovia Accords may be a bad idea after all. At least I think that's what's supposed to happen. He doesn't free them at the end of the film, and we never find out anything more about the Accords, so... I don't know, draw your own conclusions. Maybe we'll find out in the next film for another 15 pounds. Captain America doesn't really come off any better, spending most of the film acting like a kind of brutish child. He spends the film rushing into situations without context or discussion, endangering others and unnecessarily lengthening their fight. This is all centered around his affection for a guy he knew a century ago. He doesn't know if it's the guy that he used to know, and in fact, he has no idea how powerful the guy is, as the attack on Berlin shows. In quieter scenes, he brags about his straightforward black and white view of everything, betraying the fact that he has no idea about the complexities of international relations or the value of lives other than his and his friends. Actually, that's not quite fair. He gets a good scene with Scarlet Witch earlier on when he tells her that she should have considered the value of the other lives she could have saved before she saved his, even though she knows him. But then later he beats up a series of SWAT officers, knowing full well they're just doing their jobs, and in fact they're acting in the law when he isn't. They aren't Hydra agents, they're not Nazi spies, they're just normal people with normal lives, and yet he still beats the shit out of them. This isn't the captain that you got to know in the First Avenger, the kind of guy who would throw himself on a grenade to save a bunch of strangers. This Captain America is a bully, the kind of guy who thinks that might makes right. Lots of the marketing on the film has revolved around the idea that each side is equal, Team Cap or Team Iron Man. In the end, the only discussion I was having was which team I hated more. Those are the more objective things I think are definitely wrong with Captain America Civil War. The next two sections are more about my own personal beliefs and tastes. I understand if you don't agree with them quite as much. Just one thing, don't jump to the defense of the film, don't give it excuses when it shouldn't have them. Because a movie like this costs more than some countries make in a year. They should have the oversight to do this. It's ironic actually, because the whole film's about oversight. Anyway. There's nothing wrong with the style of Civil War. There's just nothing right about it. Gone are the exciting, vibrant locations of Iron Man, Thor, the first Avenger. Instead, we get these bland, repetitive, dull places where just big fights take place. There are four major fights in the film, and three of them take place in an airfield, i.e. a big parking lot, a street, i.e. a big parking lot, and an office. This lack of diversity in setting is made even worse by the bland, made-for-TV style directing. The Rousseaus prove themselves to be capable action directors with Winter Soldier, so I don't know exactly what went wrong here. In every conversation scene, all you ever get is shot, reverse shot. It works, sure, you can see what's going on and everything, you know who's talking, but it makes it kind of inoffensive, kind of dull to watch. And you get a sneaking suspicion they were framing at mid-wides the whole time to make sure it was safe for watching on a smartphone as well. The fights aren't much better because they're really heavily edited to cover up the gaps in the choreography and the stuntmen. That's in stark comparison to Winter Soldier where there were lots of long takes and imaginative moves during fights to show off the really cool choreography they had. To be honest, I kind of expected it, because this is an emerging trend in Marvel's hiring of directors. If you look at the first few directors they hired, they looked for people who were interesting, left field, had strange directorial choices. You had John Favreau, a guy typically known for independent comedy, direct Iron Man. You had Kenneth Branagh, who mostly has directed Shakespeare before, taking on Thor, which I thought was, you know, a really interesting choice. 
But then in this later phase of Marvel films, they've mostly turned to TV directors to do stuff. They had Alan Taylor from Game of Thrones doing Thor The Dark World, and then we've got the Rousseaus, who have mostly just done sitcom work on TV. As a result, they get what people seem to crave. Bland, homogenous visuals, rote procedural performances, and an endless kowtowing to Kevin Feig's monomaniacal vision. Civil War is a heavily political film. It has an intelligent sense of connection to life in the modern world, or so I'm told. But in what is probably the most controversial part of this review, I'd like to make the claim that Civil War actually spews some really gross politics. The first thing I'd like to talk about is how it treats Black Panther. He gets a great intro, he's intelligent, cool, deeply committed to the Sokovia Accords, but then immediately after his father dies, he gives up diplomacy, forgets about the Accords, puts on his costume and goes out to fight. So that's all of his characterization out of the window. So when Marvel introduces a black leader, they want him to be otherworldly, inexplicable, animalistic, volatile, physically violent, and somehow slightly mystical as well. To remind us of his otherness, whenever he jumps on screen, he gets his own musical leitmotif. It's a set of tribal drums and a little pipe like this. It's like he's turned on a world music CD every time he gets in a fight. It's an effort by Marvel to remind us that he's not like us, whenever us is a a white man. He's otherly, primal, different, African. I'm happy he's in the film, I'm happy Marvel is trying to increase their representation, but I'm uncomfortable about the fact they gave him that music, especially because there's only one other character who gets their own motif, and that's the Vision. The Vision is a magically powered super robot. So when Marvel says they have a black leader in their film and they think he needs his own leitmotif, what they're really saying is, we think it's as novel as having a magical robot in the movie. Black African leader, magical robot. One of the same for Marvel. And even with all of that undermining, the film is very uncomfortable of having three black characters, so they promptly paralyse one of them. Ah, good. They finally evened out the odds again. There were way too many black people in this film. Let's count down the odds. Let's see how many black characters are going to be in the films versus how many white characters are in the films now. So on the one side, we've got Wilson and T'Challa. Yep. And then we've got, on the other side, Tony, Steve, Bucky, Tash, Clint, Wanda, Peter, Scott, Sharon and Zemo. Brilliant, folks. Representation's finally here. Marvel's done all of they can. Yippee! Aside from these issues, there's a very pervasive sense in the film that violence is always the right answer to any kind of problem. Steve brags about going into a situation because it's the right thing to do, and Tony bemoans having to chase after him, and then they fight, both ignoring the investigative solution. They both bemoan having to fight each other again, ignoring the possibility of waiting and debating. And at the end of the film, Tony lashes out at Cap and Bucky, having discovered that his parents were killed by him, completely ignoring all reason, even though both of the characters are trying to stop him. There's something brilliantly childish about that. There's even a bit when Tony goes, he killed my mom. My mom. Where's my juice box? And I don't think that's actually out of the ordinary for blockbuster films overall. For instance, Batman vs Superman was a really violent film. There was like physical branding of humans in it and stuff, and that's quite gross. But what's amazing to me is how much critics seem to think that this is better somehow. They say, oh, Batman vs Superman was really gloomy, it was too grim, uh, it was very violent, I wasn't very happy about that. But this movie is good fun. Uh, it's really, really funny, and there's some really good one-liners in it, and there's lots and lots of horrible violence, and I think that's right, I think that's good. It doesn't, doesn't make much sense to me, it seems like a disparity in critical reaction. But if we look at the first 40 minutes of Captain America Civil War, there's actually a huge amount of violence in it. There's assassination, torture and brainwashing before the opening title sequence. There's a suicide bombing on a soft civilian target that kills 15 innocent people. There's another bombing on a political target that kills a number of people. There's a man who gets tortured to death by being forcibly drowned on screen. I don't know if that's any better because there are some jokes in the film. In fact, if anything, I think that's actually worse. I think that's the film wanting the violence to just wash over you as a backdrop for fun. I think it wants you to think that violence is a normal part of life, that terror is real and ever-present, that there's no escape from innocent bloodshed and the only way to prevent it is to kill more. From Marvel and Disney, the lesson is clear for any kids watching. If a problem presents itself, if there is an obstacle, punch it, fight it, torture it until it's dead. I said at the start of this review that I wanted a blockbuster to do five things. It has to have likeable and believable characters, a plot that makes sense, not be offensive, be well made, and make me feel something. Like frills, or make me laugh. Captain America Civil War is a film where horrible, inconsistent characters muddle their way through a nonsensical plot, told in the blandest way possible, with lashings of reactionary politics, endless violence, and insidious racism. 
It did make me feel, it made me feel sick to my stomach. And it wasn't just that the film was made and that it's making so much money, but more that there's an endless critical approval of the whole thing. That everyone who I know who's watched it has said, wasn't that great? Wasn't that amazing? Ignoring how disturbing its messages were, how terribly written its plot and script is, and how derivative and cash grabbing the whole franchise is now. The statistical likelihood is you probably like the film and you're probably fuming behind your keyboard right now. That's okay, I understand that. And this has happened to me with films that I really liked and other people hated. <laughs> Pacific Rim. I get it. But please let me know in the comments down below what you felt about it. I really wanna know how you felt about what I had to say about the film as well. If I've maybe swayed you a little bit more on the movie, if you've moved from, oh my God, it was the best movie ever to like, okay, well, there are some problems with that film then please, I really would like to know about that. And if you hated it, just give me a fat old dislike, bro. Usually at the end of my videos, I say subscribe, but I suspect you're probably gonna dislike this. So just have a really nice week, guys. In the UK, it's really sunny right now, and I know this film's just about to come out in the US, so just everyone go out and enjoy the sun.